Thank you everybody for being here. We've got a good uh, crew. Um, I wanted just to welcome you uh, to uh, our webinar. And uh, I just want to, our webinar series. Uh, we have uh, already had one and we're going to be doing more throughout the year. Uh, so part of what we're doing is we're bringing together a global community to share the latest information, tips and resources to help uh, stop the growing plastic pollution crisis. And uh, I just want to introduce myself. My name is Jackie Nunez. I am the uh, advocacy program manager for Plastic Pollution Coalition and founder of The Last Plastic Straw. Plastic Pollution Coalition is a growing global alliance of more than 1,200 organizations, businesses, and um, thought leaders in 75 countries. And we're working to educate, connect, and advocate for a world free of plastic pollution. Um, plastic Pollution Coalition provides a platform to amplify effective strategies and common messaging in order to foster resilient solutions. Uh, we work to empower people and organizations to take action to stop plastic pollution and to live plastic free. So today, um, we're gonna to be focusing on the plastic pandemic strategies, solutions in times of COVID-19. Uh, we'll be highlighting current strategies for reducing plastic pollution during and after COVID-19. Uh, I'm just so pleased to be joined by Cassia Patel of Oceanic Global. E. Fox of Beyond Plastics and Lindsay Hole of Dispatch Goods. So we have a few uh, tips before we get started. Uh, we invite you to participate in our poll questions. Uh, share your questions in the chat. And if you would like to share on social, please tag us and our presenters. And we have the tags right now on, on this um, slide right now, as you can see. Okay, so we're gonna start into the poll questions. We have three poll questions to get us started. All right, tell us more about yourself. We'll give you some moments to do that. All right, so it looks like majority of you guys are uh, working for NGOs, organizations. I, I recognize actually a lot of you. Um, wow, we got a great uh, showing too of concerned citizens. That's, that's awesome, awesome to hear. Love to get you guys involved and businesses, yes. All right, this is great and welcome students. This is amazing. All right, so we're gonna go to the next poll question. What's your biggest plastic waste pain point right now? All right, yes. Uh, looks like overwhelming majority is food service waste from delivery and dining. I feel you. I'm trying to support local businesses as well. And that's one of the things that I'm trying to get around. All right. So we got uh, one more poll question. Do you feel safe using reusables right now? This is a yes, no. Go ahead. Okay. It looks like a majority of you guys do feel uh, safe using reusables right now. Um, thank you for sharing a bit about yourselves. This is great. This is great for us to know and, and to help us steer our conversation. Uh, for you, some of you that are not sure, no opinion, hopefully will help uh, relieve that, um, that, that doubt that maybe you might have as far as reusable goes. Okay. So we're going to our agenda. You can see on the slide here. Um, that we're going to, uh, I just want to go through the agenda. We're going to have the, the welcome panelist introductions and then we're going to go to Q&A. Um, all right, and then get to a moderated discussion. So first we're going to start off with um, Kasia Patel. Um, she is the program director of Oceanic Global, a global NGO that engages new audiences in ocean conservation. Her work with Oceanic Global includes overseeing their grassroots initiatives, policy reform efforts, educational programming and managing the Oceanic Standard TOS. It's a free set of in industry specific resources for adopting sustainable practices that meet both businesses and environmental needs with a focus on eliminating single use plastics and improving waste management. Cassie has formal training as an environmental engineer, underwater research biologist and in sustainable design. Um, we can go ahead and start right now. Cassia, welcome. Awesome. Thanks so much, Jackie. It's great to be here and thanks all for joining in. Um, lovely to see some familiar faces uh, and many new ones, which is really exciting. Um, so I'm just going to take a little bit of time now for, for the, these intro remarks and we'll, and we'll dive into everything more deeply through the conversation. Um, but just to, for, for those who may have not heard of Oceanic Global before, we are a nonprofit that engages new audiences in ocean conservation. And we're really focused on driving behavior change at both the individual level as well as the industry level. Um, so pairing grassroots actions and changing the, our behaviors in, in our individual lifestyles with working with businesses and helping them change their practices to really get large 
larger and larger impact. Um, so we essentially have a sustainability consulting service as well as a badge verification system. Um, and we do offer many resources for different in businesses in different industries. Um, I saw there was one business owner or sorry, one uh, restaurant in the audience, which is amazing um, and many business owners. So uh, hope, hoping to speak to you all as well as others. Um, but we do provide resources for hospitality, music, the music industry, festivals, concerts, etc., um, office spaces, professional sports, and um, and touristic destinations as well. Um, so, but today, a lot of this guidance is really focused on businesses in hospitality and tourism industries who have been suffering so much throughout this period, and really focusing on helping these businesses reopen in a way that's consistent with their sustainability values, specifically um, guiding to to avoid unnecessary single-use plastic and waste. Uh, so we recently launched guidelines, um, what, what we called our COVID-19 plastic free reopening guidelines uh, and we, we launched, this was a coalition effort so we hosted a series of town halls to get stakeholder input um, and we actually just launched a revision of those guidelines earlier this week. So um, I think the team has the link if they can throw that in the chat for you all just to reference and that will be in the follow up as well. Um, but just to walk you through quickly what we've included, we began with an investigation on the truth. Um, what do we really know about the virus? How does it spread? Are reusable safe? So thrilled to see that many of you do feel safe using reusables and that's a huge win. I know the beginning of this conversation in March and in April we really had no idea what to expect and what to believe and so it's really the more that we dove into this the more confident we felt in recommending reusables which was really um, reassuring and, and, and wonderful to see and so um, so we highlight a little bit of, of that uh, literature review here, um, and then we dive into operational recommendations, giving specific recommendations for businesses um, with specific vendors and best practices and protocols, dishwashing temperatures, cleaning protocols, etc. Um, and we do touch upon waste management, how that's changed um, in this new landscape, and also how we can how it still needs to be a priority. Uh, next slide. So just to give you a taste of what's included um, in the truth, this literature review, we also have a separate fact sheet that dives into um, in, in greater depth, um, but we do highlight the recent statement that some of our friends were able to release and get out there. Um, and which I think now has actually over 130 signatures from public health experts around the world endorsing that reusables are safe. So it's no longer a question. We know they are safe um, and we just, it's just a matter of how that needs to be put in place, what protocols need to be in place, what sort of, um, sanitizing measures, employee training measures, um, dishwashing temperatures, et cetera. And so, uh, so yeah, here's just more um, literature backing that <clears throat> and highlighting that the virus really spreads from human to human contact through aerosols, not through surfaces. Um, and then we also included a regulations database. So looking at what countries and authorities around the world are saying, uh, we were thrilled to see that in places like Singapore, uh, the government is actually encouraging consumers to bring their own reusable containers when buying food. Um, in Australia, the Victorian government said there's no reason that disposables should be safer than reusables if proper protocols are in place. Um, and then some countries actually coming out with specific temperatures for dishwashing guidance, um, thereby endorsing that these, these are safe practices. And so we highlight, and within our guidelines, we always recommend solutions in a hierarchy of, um, uh, of, of solutions. And so we start by focusing on reusables. And so reusables always are the best practice if that's possible within your scope and within the context. Um, so here we highlight a series of uh, vendors that are offering uh, professional reuse services around the world. So if it's a professional reuse service, you know then that they're taking extra care um, in their handling and cleaning protocols as well. Um, and this is by no means is comprehensive, but a global sampling of what exists out there. So I encourage all of you, I know we got some great global participation today from Iceland to New Zealand to Nigeria. So take a look at what's available within your region um, and how that might be more relevant. Uh, next slide. And then we do touch upon disposables that we would approve. And so this really is based upon local waste management infrastructure. Um, but with that in mind, these are some plastic alternatives that, that could be uh, considered um, keeping in mind some basic greenwashing principles. And so we highlight um, that we, further in our recently revised greenwashing guide, breaking down terms um, like biodegradable, bioplastic, compostable plastic. And so if there's time, we can dive into what some of those terms do mean. But there is a lot of misinformation in the space. 
Uh, and then we did touch upon also condiments, menus, these high touch surfaces and areas and finding solutions. We were able to feature a vendor Sestra systems that offers a touchless dispenser for bulk condiments. So you can still have bulk. Um, you don't need individual condiment containers. Jackie has a great story um, actually of her brother and his restaurant and how they would, it's easier to have bulk condiment containers that you can then wash and clean um, rather than the small sachets and packages. And so um, that's just one example of some of the, the pain points that we've thought through. Next slide, please. Uh, yep, so just encouraging businesses to reopen sustainably, stay true to their values. And actually in the research we've been doing, we've seen that uh, consumers want businesses to embody their values now more than ever. Actually, that's increased throughout the past six months throughout this pandemic period. And so it will be really important for businesses as they're reopening to, to align with that, especially as we look to 2021. Uh, next slide. And so um, here's our contact info, our website, and the, the link for the guidelines that Emily's just dropped in the chat. Thank you, Cassia. That, that was amazing. So uh, yeah, so like uh, she mentioned, the link's in the chat. Feel free to click on that. It's a great resource, some, such great guides for Oceanic Global. It's just it's invaluable what they've provided. Um, a little bit of housekeeping I forgot to mention at the beginning is uh, we're going to be providing all of these links at the end. Uh, we'll follow up with an email to everyone who signed up for this uh, this webinar. And so you'll be getting all these links. You'll be getting all this follow-up um, things. So don't feel like you have to be you know, writing all this down or, or taking it. Um, sometimes I like to follow as I go along. All right. So the next one, we're going to have uh, Eve Fox. Uh, Eve Fox is a digital director of Beyond Plastics, where she oversees the organization's online advocacy and fundraising campaigns, social media, and events. Eve has been helping progressive nonprofit organizations harness the power of the internet to raise money, change policy, build movements, and make the world a better place since 2001. After getting her start in online advocacy and communications at Oceana, she spent 12 years earning her online organizing, fundraising, advocacy, and marketing stripes as vice president at M MR Strategic Services, where she helped build the firm's digital division and created thriving progressive exchange online community, which she moderated for a decade. Eve lives in upstate New York with her family, where she is active in environmental cons conservation and local food and sustainability issues. Welcome, Eve. Thanks, Jackie. Thank you yeah. guys so much for having me. Um, it's a real honor to be with you all. Um, so I'm with Beyond Plastics, which is a nationwide project that was founded in 2019. So we're very new. Uh, it's based at Bennington College in Bennington, Vermont, um, where we're hosted by uh, Bennington College's Center for the Advancement of Public Action, which is a really lovely part of Bennington. Um, Beyond Plastics was founded by a woman named Judith Ank, who I'm sure many of you know or have heard of. Um, she worked in the New York State government for a long time and then was um, the EPA regional administrator for New York, New Jersey, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands under President Obama, um, at which time she was really desperate to start working on plastic pollution issues. And um, when administrations changed, she decided she was going to do just that. So she's a visiting fellow at Bennington College, which is why we are based there. Um, uh, and this is our website. You can see we're beyondplastics.org and um, all our social media handles. We would love for you to follow us if you're not already, and we will probably follow you back. And I say we, I mean me mostly. <laughs> um, so next slide, please. Uh, I don't know about the rest of you. I know many of you work, um, work on this issue because I saw your, your names in the chat, but to me at least it felt like there was so much progress and momentum about plastic pollution issues. And it was frontline news and people, awareness was being raised and um, things seemed like they were starting to change. And then COVID-19 happened and everything took a back seat and uh, sort of a general, a totally understandable panic took, took hold about reusable everything and hygiene and not touching things. And uh, it felt like we, we get set way, way back. Um, and, plastic bag companies and the plastics industry saw their chance to start trying to really eat away at some of the progress that we had made in the last few years with bag bans and straw bans and all sorts of things where they were actively out there lobbying the government to try to get them to say that these things were unsafe, which as we now know is, is really not true. Um, so we've been really doing a lot of uh, defense since the pandemic started, but at the same time, we've also been trying to give just regular people ways to get around 
those pain points that were mentioned in the poll earlier that I, I think we're all very aware of. So it's things like takeout containers, I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but um, just the, the experience of when people started going back to stores, um, you, can't, you couldn't use your reusable bags. And I'm sure this is still true for many of you in who are in different parts of the country and different parts of the world. There's still a lot of fear about that and many stores have really cracked down. So we've been trying to um, just come up with little tweaks and innovative solutions like this is just a little infographic, uh, well, infographic, it's a graphic that we put out on social media. Um, just one way you can get around having to take a plastic bag uh, if you don't want to. Um, there are ways to do it even when stores are, are still stuck in this panic space. Um, next slide, please. Uh, another thing that we put out is this sample letter to stores that people can use. Um, drafted this back at the end of June, shortly after um, the letter that Kasha mentioned came out from the, I think it's like up to 120, I can't remember how many experts it was, it was 115 at the time, it's a lot of them, all agreeing that reusables are safe. Um, so just a simple letter that you can, people can download um, the, the links in the slide and it's, um, thank you Emily for putting it in the chat. Um, you can edit this however you want. You can make it very specific to your grocery store. Um, it's about all the, all the things that we're really missing, like bulk bins and reusable bags and, and refillables. So um, this is just a simple tool that you can take and customize to, to make sense for you. Email it or mail it or drop it off um, at your store as one way that you can use that data that came out, which is just agreed on by, by everyone at this point that these things are safe. They're in fact, uh, in many respects, they're probably safer because it seems that the virus lives longest on plastic than any other surface. So um, one, one little tool. Um, speaking about the, the pain point with all of the food packaging, it's a, it's a real um, challenge because we recognize that this has been a horrible time for restaurants, many of whom are going under um, or just generally really struggling. So we didn't want to beat up on restaurants um, who don't really have the bandwidth right now to change practices. But what we wanted to do was um, encourage the companies that are doing really well right now, which is companies like Grubhub, Seamless, Delivery.com, Postmates, Caviar, Uber Eats, um, to try to use their influence. They have relationships with you know thousands and thousands of restaurants all around the, the country. And sorry, this is this is US based, but could be applied to other countries where similar delivery services exist. I'm just not super knowledgeable about what they are in other countries. Um, to try and get them to change their practices either in their ordering system, um, well, definitely in their ordering system to make these single use items like um, napkins, particularly plastic straws, plastic cutlery, and all the little um, ketchup packets that are totally not recyclable anywhere in the planet, as far as I know, um, to make those optional and to make them something that you have to affirmatively opt into rather than them just arriving with your meal. People are ordering at home where we, everyone has utensils, everyone has a bottle of ketchup for the most part, and they have napkins of the reusable variety. We don't need these things and most people don't want them. Um, so this is a campaign of, that's become a much bigger coalition campaign that's um, uh, OGN Global and Plastic Pollution Coalition, all our, our hosts here are part of, it was really started by um, Habits of Waste, which is a, a small organization in Los Angeles. Um, they really led the charge on this one and I've actually convinced um, Uber Eats and um, Postmates, I believe, to, to make this change to their ordering systems. And the next step on this, if people wanna get involved, or there's still a long way to go, is to then get them to use their influence with, with the many, many restaurants they partner with to make sure they get the message. Now, it's a pretty easy message. All it is is like, look at the ordering slip and just don't include these items. Save money, <laughs> save time, leave them out unless someone specifically requests them. So um, this is an ongoing campaign. We would love to have people um, join us. There's a petition you can sign. There's this uh, toolkit, which has tons of different um, tools you can use as an, ad as an advocate or an activist. There's a letter to the editor you can adapt and um, there are a whole bunch of social media graphics and, and shares you can use. Next slide, please. 
And uh, another thing that we'd like to keep pushing, keep momentum building, even in, in the face of the pandemic, is the amazing uh, federal bill that was introduced in February uh, called the Breakthrough from Plastic Pollution Act. It's our best possible um, silver bullet, if you will, um, to try and, uh, and tackle our very complex global plastic pollution problem. Um, so I encourage everyone to go to our webpage. It has a, a whole bunch of resources about the bill, including a, an action you can take to uh, ask your members of Congress to sign on to it. That's really the next step in Congress. It doesn't have that many co-sponsors yet, and it really deserves them. So if you're not already actively um, promoting it and trying to get your senators and your representative to, to sign on, please take a look at it. It's, it's really worthwhile. And by the way, this is Judith. She's at the, um, at the copy of the bill at the introduction in, in DC back in, the, uh, in February. And many people who were uh, part of this, um, on this call, I'm sure, were involved in helping to draft that legislation. So it's, it's really good. Um, last slide, please. Um, <laughs> I think I dated myself with this, this little social media share because I'm sure many younger people don't even know who Austin Powers is, but I thought it was funny. Um, anyone wants to contact me, here's my email address. I would love to hear from you. And thanks again for having me. Thank you. Yes, you know, Beyond Plastics is it's a great organization. Um, we have, again, we have the link um, in there in the chat and there's just some great tools. I've already altered that, um, that letter and, and even sent it to our uh, Board of Supervisors and uh, so you can really make it you know, customized in a few businesses here in Santa Cruz. So it's a great resource with some great um, uh, fact-based um, information with links that they can go to and find out more. All right, so um, the next one would be uh, Lindsay Hole. She's a uh, co-founder of Dispatch Goods. So we're talking about solutions. This is a great solution for reusable systems that we think is the wave of the future. Um, and she has created a new system of reusable food containers in the takeout and delivery space. She's currently operating in San Francisco Bay Area. She became involved in the sustainability movement due to her connection with the ocean, with the ocean as a surfer. And she previously ran Surfire, Surfrider Hawaii's Ocean Friendly Restaurant Program before returning to school to work on an MBA at Berkeley Haas, hoping to find the intersection of sustainability and business. And I think she's on her way to doing that with this uh, great company, Dispatch Goods. Take it away, Lindsay. Thank you. Um, it's really exciting to be here and, and thanks for all the work that's done on behalf of the education. Uh, I think towards reusables, it's made our job a lot easier from the implementation standpoint. So um, yeah, so I'm Lindsay, the CEO and founder of Dispatch Goods. Um, and uh, you can go to the next slide. So from our end, we were operating largely in SOMA and then um, we, were, we were partnering with tech companies and they were purchasing dispatch goods memberships for their employees. It worked out really well because we had a large density of members and, and we had a lot of restaurants and then COVID hit and our business kind of came to a screeching halt because no one was going to work downtown anymore. Um, and at that same time, we were seeing such a, a large increase in the single use packaging. It's been estimated that there's a 250 to 300% rise in single use packaging. So we were still just as motivated to get this reusable program going, um, but we just found new challenges on how to do it in this home delivery space. Um, next slide. But after doing hundreds of customer interviews, we found the same thing that the poll found, which is people felt like reusables were safe. And we met with a lot of um, uh, kind of experts uh, in the field about the science behind reusables. And so we got to a level that we also felt that our uh, dishwashing processes were very, um, very safe um, and thorough. So we decided to launch into delivery and takeout kind of in the middle of the pandemic. So, um, so our goal is to replace all of the single use packaging and takeout and delivery with a reusable bag and reusable packaging. The next slide. So Dispatch Goods considers itself a reverse logistics company. We essentially collect, wash, and redistribute the reusable products so that we can accelerate the solutions. Uh, we start in the place that, that this poll identified as the biggest pain point for people, which is in uh, restaurant takeout and delivery. And if you go to the next slide, and we've, we've started in takeout to begin with. So right now, when you're checking out from one of our partner restaurants, you'll see a zero waste fee of $1.50 per meal as you're checking out. 
and you'll toggle it. And then the restaurant is notified to package your food in a reusable bag in a reusable container. And then you'll get a text from dispatch knowing which day we'll be collecting in your neighborhood. And 15 minutes before we're there, you'll get another text and you just put out the bag in the containers and we come collect them. So it's kind of like curbside recycling. And um, my co-founder Jessica's working on her PhD in waste management. Uh, and we've always believed that this is a systems problem and we really need a system solution. And so we don't think that it's like a, a magic container or even like a magic system. It's once it gets, once the containers get to the consumer, how do you get them processed and back to the, to the um, business? And so that's what we spent the whole summer doing is figuring out the curbside collection logistics, how to separate clean bins from dirty bins, um, how, to, how to sort, how to efficiently transport. And so it's been a really exciting thing to see this idea we had a year and a half ago actually operate now. So you can kind of see this is what our, our van setup is. And we right now are operating in San Francisco only, but we'll be expanding to the East Bay in um, late September, early October. So I saw there was quite a few people from the East Bay in the chat. Um, feel free to connect with me for more details if you, or if you have any favorite restaurants that you'd like to see on, on our platform. Um, but yeah, all of our containers right now are either steel or um, glass, and we're adding about one to two restaurants every week. So we're trying to keep that offering really exciting and onboard some of the best restaurants in the Bay Area. We found that restaurants, that there's not a lot of pushback. The restaurants themselves feel frustrated by how much waste they're seeing go out the door. And for when we begin to talk to them, it seems like they're just ready for the solution as long as it works within their current operations. So we try to make it as low lift for the restaurants as possible um, by mimicking the normal kind of ordering system and integrating with their with the system that they current, currently have. And that's worked really well. So we're starting, like I said, with restaurant boxes. But in our opinion, the way that this really becomes the um, something that can compete on cost with single use products is by increasing the amount of items we collect per household. So that's going to that's going to happen with increased restaurant density but also grocery store partnerships and other household items, um, us being that collection and processing arm of the logistics chain. So if there's any other um, businesses in that, that are in this um, webinar, then feel free to reach out and talk to me about what your struggles are in implementing reusables. And I'd be happy to, to figure out if there's a way to partner us either in you know, the near future or even later on. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay. That's incredible. So, um, yeah, I, I think that one of the, the main questions we always get, or I, I've seen too, and you, you've talked in other webinars, is uh, can you come to our town? Like, I, I do want you in, in Santa Cruz. Um, uh, that, was, that was the first time I saw that you were looking to branch out and do some of the, the household items as well. And um, one of the first things I thought about in San Francisco, and maybe you're in contact with her, but we do have a, a coalition member, um, Stephanie Regini that has feel good and they just opened up a store in Berkeley and I could totally see you guys working together to get a system. Um, yeah, so yeah, great. I've talked to Stephanie. Stephanie's a good friend. So we yeah, love to awesome. work together and she's a big, um, yeah, she's a big supporter of us and, and likewise. Mm -hmm. And as far as bringing dispatch to your town, we, we get that question a lot, like you said. So we've started, uh, if you're really interested in bringing this to your town, creating petitions so you can kind of get people to pre-sign up. And once we reach a certain threshold of signatures, then we know that there's an appetite for this in, in a certain area. And we can start talking to restaurants and seeing about expansion. And that's working well so that we, you know, our limited team can make sure that we're using our resources and getting the most bang for our buck. Great. I, I, yeah, I would love to talk to you about Santa Cruz. Okay, so we're, um, we're going to get to our Q&A section. Uh, we have a few uh, questions that were uh, already sent to us via email, and then we got a few that, that popped up on the chat that we are uh, curated. So I'm going to just go ahead and start right into it. Um, how was your advocacy messaging on calls to action change in response to COVID-19? And anyone can take this. This is from Nancy Pine, uh, Oceana, in Washington, D.C. So, anyone? I'm happy to jump in first. And yeah. I think, um, you know, in response, certainly we were 
uh, a little bit quieter with our industry program at the beginning as, as we were waiting for the dust to settle just to figure out what was going on. And, and it's definitely been a challenging period for a lot of the businesses that we normally work with, um, as well as the people that we, we normally work with and engage. Um, but, but I, and so that actually was the inspiration for us creating the COVID guidelines because we wanted to still support businesses, but we needed to make it relevant and we needed to make it um, useful as well for them to just understand how we could provide value um, in this really difficult time. So for us, that this, that was how we pivoted by creating these resources. Resources are something that we've created. We're good at it. We know how to bring people together and find out solutions that we can share. Um, so so that's, that was the choice that we took. Um, and so far, it's been pretty well received. And, and we're, we're seeing a lot of businesses are, are feeling more confident um, and excited that they can be using reusables or um, realizing that reusables actually are more cost effective. And so right now, when, when you know businesses are, are counting pennies and really trying to save as much as they can on operations, it actually makes a lot of sense where it's possible. And so um, through projects like Lindsay's and Dispatch Goods, just making that possible from a takeout perspective is really exciting. Um, I would also shout out to that we've seen a lot, a, a huge increase in volunteer capacity. A lot of people reaching out, like all of you who are joining this webinar today, um, which is amazing. And so I think it's wonderful to see that when there, people do have more free time, they, they want to be a part of something positive and greater. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think Lindsay pretty much answered that, right? So I'm going to go right to, to Eve. Yeah. Um, I would say it's very similar. Uh, we definitely were quieter for a while, just giving space for people to deal with the craziness of life and um, certainly stopped pushing on advocacy around things like skip the straw bills for a little bit um, because governments are just so slammed trying to deal with the pandemic that it mm -hmm. was, seemed very inappropriate. <laughs> And like it wasn't also going to work. Um, and then I, I think that we also uh, pivoted a little bit to providing resources and education and, and just online um, engagement opportunities for, for kids. And um, we did a whole, uh, we didn't make any of these movies, but we did a um, plastic pollution film series virtual that people could participate in. Um, and some kids programming, some sort of introduction, introduction to plastic pollution for, for little ones, um, webinars, and uh, a youth actathon to give kids, uh, I have kids, so I know that it's, it's hard to just be home. Um, and yeah. they wanted to connect with other young people and, and to stay active. I think we've also seen a, definitely a lot of interest um, as people I, I think are home more and um, many people weren't able to work, so um, they were, excited about opportunities to engage and the um, the whole the plastic campaign was definitely has been a big hit uh, I think it's it's just very relevant to people's lives and they're they're stuck in that kitchen with all <laughs> all that packaging plastic, and they yeah. want to do something about it so that's been very um, well received yeah yeah you know, we experienced the same thing we um, I think one thing that we're finding uh, for plastic pollution coalition and a lot of our coalition members is it's been an opportunity to really kind of step back and be creative in, in our outreach. And what I am really loving, especially as far as the coalition goes, is where I'm seeing a lot more collaboration happening between coalition members and just amplifying the overall message together. And so that's, that's really encouraging for me. And, and I do see that need. People are seeing firsthand their waste and businesses too. And it's just getting, people are just over it. Um, even with all the efforts from the plastics industry to, uh, greenwash their their uh, plastic is, is calling it hygienic and safe. Okay, so the next question we got is, um, many people in my community are going back to using single-use plastics, uh, example, grocery bags, or use more single-use plastics, ceramic and containers for sauce while dining in at restaurant. Um, I, I'm in an effort to prevent the spread of COVID-19. How can we alter their thinking? And this is from Philip John R. Cruz from the University of Guam, the Sea Grant Guam. So anyone have want to take a stab at that? Um, yeah, sure. So I think and, and definitely feel share our guides <laughs> with any of those businesses. That, yeah. Please do. Um, and uh, we do have a social toolkit too, and you can tag your favorite restaurant. Um, we've also made it easy. So if, um, we do have a QR code. So if you have it on your phone and you're going to order in person, that uh, the whoever, if you ideally catch the business manager or the owner, um, but if you get them to scan the code, it'll take them directly to the resources. So can share that too. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that's, that's an easy one um, for your pocket. Um, but yeah, but I think in general, just highlighting that reusables can be safe um, and are safe in many cases. And, um, and also for specific use cases, like 
if you're taking, I know in New York, a different use case has been just having cocktails to go and drinks to go, which never existed before, but that's created this whole new plastic waste stream. Um, so if you're able to use your own straw, if you bring your own metal straw for things and you don't need to request that from takeaway or from, from cocktails or whatever it is, um, that's one way that you know how that straw has been treated. The employee doesn't have to handle it. And so that's just a win-win on both ends. Um, and um, yeah, and I know there's a couple others too, but I'll, but I'll pass it off. Yeah, I would say, like, point, I mean, restaurants, the compostable clamshells or the compostable ramekins are pretty expensive. So I think that there's a, a serious cost savings if they can consider other systems, either like supplying the condiments at back of house and then, and then putting, plating them and bringing them out. Or it sounds like these, um, like, hands-free dispensers are a really good option. But in my experience, the restaurants are, I mean, now they're spending over a dollar per order of the single-use packaging. So there's a real opportunity to talk to them about, you know, the, the stainless steel ramekins and filling those back a house and, and bringing them out versus paying for that ramekin. Even there, if there's a little bit more sauce waste, which is probably what their fear is, I think that it will be well offset by the price of the, the, um, the compost, the, the bioplastics, which are pretty expensive. I'm trying to remember the name I'm blanking, but I'll, I'll share the link afterwards. Um, one of the groups who signed on to our, our letter to the um, food delivery services has some great resources at just a, literally breaking down the costs of um, reusable versus uh, single use and the, how long it takes to uh, you know, make your money back and then some, which might be a, a helpful thing to share because it, it's, it's very stark. It's just, it's gonna save you money. Um, yeah, that's the Rethink Disposables. Yes, they have some great fact sheets. And they'll go through item by item. And I think in some cases, even the payback period is four to five days if you choose a reusable item, which is like, you know, it seems like a total no brainer um, once you dive into it. And I think as Eve mentioned too, actually, what we did include, um, we compiled studies that were looking at how long COVID lasts on surfaces and plastic was one of the longest. So um, there's definitely no reason that plastic would be safer than a reusable bag or even a paper bag, but use, reusable would be the best. Oh, and one other note there too that I wanted to mention because uh, bags were one of the examples, uh, the New York State bag ban finally was able to, is able to move on and be put in place, which is really exciting. So um, there hopefully will be no more excuses for, for businesses that are in New York State. Um, and, and hopefully the delay on bag bans across the nation, across the world will, will um, begin to proceed there as well. Yeah, that's great. We did that in California as well. So yeah, actually, I'll, I'll just move on to, I'm going to go to one of the, the chat questions. Um, Maya asks, there's a, a Thai restaurant that I love, but they wrap their, their food in plastic. It makes me feel sad every time I eat something there. What do I do? Um, so E, that, that just goes right to you too with the, I think the letter would be a great place to start. Yeah, and I would use the letter and just be, um, so they may not read the letter. <laughs> you know, I think that's one of the things is like next time you're there, if you're there in person at this point, I don't know if you are. Um, if you have a relationship with someone there, I would just have a friendly conversation. And, you know, just, of course, like the letter leads with a lot of compassion and um, you, you love this restaurant. So they lead with that um, and just explain that it makes you deeply sad and you know, it's not, it's not getting recycled. It's, if you want to get into that, Maya, I think you know all those facts. Um, you could share those. And then as much as possible to share the actual solutions with them and, and try and make it easy for them. I'm sure this is a, restaurants are an awful business at any time, but this is like the worst time possible for them. So if you can do the legwork for them and just present them with some alternatives that um, make sense or cost effective and are, are not going to mess up their their whole business model, which I don't see why they would. Um, I think that you might get a really good reaction from them, but just lead with being friendly and, and helpful. Um, and just fact-based, obviously, is really helpful. Mm -hmm. So you could, yeah. you could try to adapt the letter. Um, some of it will, will make a lot of sense, and some of it you, you probably would need to tweak a bit. Yeah, make it personal. Um, so yeah, actually, that, that's okay. We're going to lead into the next one that we got. Um, on email, do you have any tips on how we can implement sustainability and reduce the use of plastic in our daily lives with COVID concerns? And that's Amy Powell from Attainable Albany, New York. And so just even when you're talking about the, the restaurants, one thing I always tell people, because it's, it's this pain point is those restaurants, right, and the packaging. Um, 
you can still support him by buying gift certificates, you know, um, and, and do it that way. If you just can't stand all that packaging and it's really hard and your community's not doing it. But um, do you guys have any other tips that uh, you want to share? Daily COVID, plastic free COVID tips? I mean, I, I, I go to the grocery store now, so I, I think it depends on your comfort level. If you're still need, feeling like you want to order things and you're not comfortable going into a store, um, that's more challenging for sure. I mean, I think that there are different companies who have somewhat better packaging um, practices than others, but it, it's, you're, you know, you're, it's limiting. But if you're comfortable going into a store, um, I know some, some stores near me actually have their bulk stuff back up and running, even though there, it's not like 100%. Um, I did start just bringing my bags again and I would just go to, um, you know, depending on the store, I would either just say like, hey, you don't have to pack it. I'll just pack it myself. Or if there's a self checkout, I, I use that option so that I don't have to be taking a million plastic bags. Um, yeah, that just reminds me that is a workaround for some of these states that still have not lifted their, um, uh, their ban on the ban or whatever they're calling it, but um, the temporary uh, lift on that because the workaround is just have them put it in the cart and then you take it to your car and then you bag it there. Um, so that's what we've been doing. Uh, we have another question on the chat. Do you know if it's uh, up to each business to accept reusables in California or is it up to the county and state health regulations? Um, it's from Cindy Cassell from City of Watsonville. Um, I know that it's, it kind of depends on the, uh, I, I think a lot of businesses, that's, that's part of the problem. They're kind of winging it as they go. And this is specific to my area. I, I know that the county and state health regulations do dictate not only restaurants, but uh, businesses and what they can and cannot do. And so they're trying to, to cover that, but the implementation of it sometimes, it depends on the business. Have you, uh, say, have, have any of you guys experienced that or do you want to add in? Uh, certainly, we've been seeing that restaurants are still struggling for people to BYO containers. Um, yeah. I did see that Starbucks was starting to take cups again, uh, um, and I don't know if that's happening in California. There's one really cool um, pho place in the East Bay that we talked to who they were getting mason jars donated, and then for people that wanted uh, reusables, they were uh, washing the mason jars and then filling um, the mason jars to go. So, you know, with, with a restaurant that's in your neighborhood, I think that right now you'd be surprised how willing and flexible they are largely because like I said, they, they don't like this either. Um, and uh, there's so many jars and, and other things around that people are disposing of that that can save the restaurant costs if you do a mason jar drive to replace some of that plastic waste, at least for customers that request it. Um, so that might be a good starting point, but the, the BYO handing it over to the, across the counter, I think has been a, still a challenge for restaurants to feel comfortable with. And I just want to add too, because that's, it, it was before COVID too. Um, that was one of the things that we really were working on, which is unfortunate is getting that accepted. And we got, you know, a lot of like uh, headway in California to have that be accepted. Uh, and then it was that we were still in the process of educating businesses that it, it is okay. But, you know, ultimately the business always has the right to refuse. If they get something that doesn't look, they don't want to bring it in and, uh, and deal with it, they can do that. And it's always been that way. So unfortunately I feel like that did set us back a little bit, um, having to explain even further. But I think as well with the work that, that you all are doing, it's really kind of educating them and making it easy to, to find the real solutions and the truth about um, disposable versus reusables and materials. So I think that's, that's really helping. So I just want to thank you guys again for all the resources and what you, you were doing for this. Okay, right. so I have another one from um, an online one. Uh, people in, in, in restaurants tell me that disposables are more hygienic in this time of pandemic. Is that accurate? Where's the research? What can we do to support takeout and stop all the waste? And this is from Janet Dementes from Boston, Massachusetts. I'm sure all of you have something to say about this one. So I'm just gonna I'll... go real quick on on the the previous one and then um, okay, and on go this for it. One. 
but I think it was one minor workaround for the accepting BYO containers, which, which definitely is difficult and, you know, it could be threatening to both employees and future customers, um, is actually having, serving in a reusable glass and then having the customer pour that into their own reusable container. And so we've seen some businesses are, are opting to do that and then um, having a dishwashing uh, capabilities for, for the glass or for the mug or whatever it was. Um, and one thing too that I wanted to highlight in terms of what you can do as, as a consumer and as an individual and supporter of restaurants and in, within your local community is also just to give feedback to businesses. So if they are opting for reusable systems, give them feedback, give them love and appreciation and really celebrate them for that um, in, the, in the comments or in person if, you, if you're seeing them in person. Um, and if they're not, use those tools also to, to be requesting that as well. Um, so if you're consistently saying no extra cutlery on seamless for example in new york um and and it's always it's always coming back to you i think that's that's um an issue on, on both parties but still just like highlighting still like, why are you giving me cutlery i'm at home i don't need it um so there are ways to just like be overly communicative and in a hospitality business um they're really receptive and responsive to how their consumers are feeling and so yeah so i just encourage people to use that um especially in in, in a positive direction to celebrate what businesses are doing yeah i agree yeah, and I would just say, uh, check out the resources that um, Kasha shared, their reopening guide. It, it's all in there. It, it is safe and there's consensus around it. So they've, they've really made it easy to share and, and broken it out very nicely. So it, it's all there. And I would, I would go with that as a place to start. Yeah, it's great. One, um, one thing talking to restaurants that we've noticed is that they're less fearful that like our clean dishes or their house clean dishes aren't clean enough for the customer and more concerned about their employees bussing dishes and what happens to like, oh, it's a, is there a cross contamination if they bus a dish and then they hold on to something clean. So what we've set up for some of the restaurants is uh, like a, their um, a bus station, people self bus their dishes. And then, uh, you know, then the, the back of house uh, employees will carry the dishes back rather than having the servers bust throughout their shift. Again, surface transmission doesn't, isn't shown to be the, the way that this is transmitted, but I know with a heightened level of anxiety around COVID, that's something that seems to help them feel more comfortable with using at least reusables for dine-in as things open up a little bit more. Yeah, I agree. We, we just recently did an, an article about reusing, um, reopening during COVID for restaurants. I actually interviewed my brother in Florida, and that was one of the concerns. And um, it was really eye-opening to, uh, to learn about some of his systems. But, you know, one thing I want to uh, point out and put everyone at ease about restaurants and reopening and some of these things, he, he really said, he said, you know, a lot of these things, when we got the guidelines, it's stuff we have to do already. Like these, I mean, all our restaurants should be have, have this level of sanitation. It is health department clothes. The only thing different really was the masks and, and, and some of the different procedures and the, the shields. He goes, but everything else, we should be doing that. And um, you know, the problem is not everyone does that. And so that actually, you know, please go to those restaurants that do. He's, he's one of the most particular ones that I've, I've met that because he knows, knows too much. I go to the restaurant with him. He won't touch anything on the table. He goes right to the bath after he orders. Um, and he's noticing crumbs on the, on the menu and everything else that he knows. And he'll go right to the bath and wash his hands and then sit down after he orders. And, and it's because he, he knows. And it's that cross-contamination that they have anyways for bacteria and viruses and everything. All that stuff was in place with our um, health heart. So I just want to, you know, put that point out to everybody too. And that should really kind of embolden you to, to just point that out. And, and I think and restaurants know that too. Um, okay. So we are coming up. We got one more minute. Let me just find a, a question here. Um, how can, how can I get more involved in plastic pollution activism within this pandemic and mobilize my friends and other teenagers alike. And this is Clara Wells Dang, Green Shoots Earth Ambassadors, and this is Arlington, Virginia. Um, I'm gonna also put in there, how can we get more extended producer responsibility? And that's Paula Jones from Ipswich uh, Waste Reduction Advisory Committee. I'm kind of setting you guys up to promote the Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act and, um, and talk about some of the other things you guys have going on that will help them. Take it away. 
anyway. That's a great, Jackie. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, would, we would love for people to get involved in um, in any of the campaigns that um, any of us have mentioned today that appeal to you. Um, I will say that in terms of the best, and, and then there's also all of these individual actions you can take that we've talked about in terms of reaching out to restaurants and, that you love in your neighborhood, reaching out to your grocery store, try, if you're in, um, in the East Bay, you, you could reach out to some restaurants to get them to sign up uh, with Dispatch Goods, which would be really cool. Um, mm -hmm. But on a, on a bigger picture scale, I, I think the, um, the best sort of weapon that we have at our disposal, and I'll just say that Beyond Plastics has a very, um, has a pretty big focus on public policy on legislation. Um, it, it's a very effective way to make big changes. Um, so, you know, you have this sort of micro, which is your life and the things that, that you touch and you see on a daily basis, um, which feel really big to us, but um, there's the macro level too, which is the laws that govern our society and that change the playing field for businesses to behave more responsibly and that affect the international waste trade. And uh, if, if you want to affect big picture, um, really the best weapon right now is this Break Free from Plastic Pollution Act. It's um, There have been a few other bills in Congress that have been introduced and, and they're really just greenwashing. Um, apologies to anyone on the call who, who was a supporter of them or whose organization <laughs> is a supporter. Um, <laughs> I'm not a huge fan of any of them, but this one is special. It's really got all, it tackles things like, as Jackie mentioned, I'm not sure if you're all familiar with that phrase, extended producer responsibility, but it's the idea of pushing responsibility for the, mostly the, uh, so both the climate impacts and the end of life impacts of plastics onto the companies that actually produce them and sell them and profit from them, rather than leaving it um, in the hands of the consumer or the developing country where that waste is shipped as recycling, it's really just garbage, um, or on the municipalities that have to deal with it, picking it up, um, picking up litter, dealing with recycling programs that, that are really very unprofitable, they're very expensive. Um, it pushes that responsibility where it belongs, which is on the companies that are making money off of it, um, which currently we don't really we don't have any of that. Um, Europe has a little bit of this, and I think there's some bills in California that were introduced um, which I, I am not super knowledgeable about, but I see Lindsay and Adi, and I'm sure Jackie could, could speak to too. Um, but on a national scale, it, it addresses that. It addresses um, limiting the amount of plastic that's produced. There's a, a, the plastics industry is actually looking to dramatically expand production of plastic worldwide. And that's really terrifying from both the climate and just a waste uh, point of view. So it, it would put a pause on new plastics facilities um, while we figure out how to stop them more permanently. <laughs> um, and then it would do things like increase the um, minimum recycled content that's required in bottles, cans, these sorts of things so that there's actually more of a market and a demand for recycled plastic because frankly, it's, it's just much more expensive right now than virgin plastic is. So there's no incentive for businesses to use it. It costs them more. Um, and it, it does a lot of other things. Um, Sorry, I'm, I'm distracted by the chat. I'll get back to you. Um, that that are all needed to to truly tackle the plastic pollution crisis. So little things piecemeal aren't going to make a big difference. Um, increasing recycling is great, but it's it's not a solution. It's never going to be a solution to a problem of this huge caliber. It, we have to address it at the source by reducing the amount of plastic that we're that we're making and disposing of. So okay, uh, I, I think Eve really uh, captured it all. Um, I'm sorry I, if you guys had anything to say, but we're gonna have to wrap it up around the hour coming up and I just wanna be conscious of everyone's time. Um, so thank you, Kasia, Eve and Lindsay for and everyone for tuning in really. Um, we, wanna, we actually wanna take a picture of everyone on the call. So if you can get the, um, uh, the what's, what's it called? The uh, group view, um, gallery view, yeah. Right on, yeah. And uh, oh, wow, look at all the people. I didn't get everyone on. We got like nine pages. All right, so in count of three, what do we want to say? Break free from plastic pollution. Ready? One, two, three. Break free from plastic pollution. Break free from plastic pollution. <laughs>
Okay, so also to, to follow up on that last question about how kids can get involved, uh, we save the date, tune in for our next webinar. It's gonna be Wednesday, September 23rd, starting at 2 p.m. Um, Pacific time, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, you can go ahead and put that slide up there, uh, Oshini. Um, the topic will be Plastic Free Planet, Youth Mobilized for Change. Our panelists will include uh, Dan, the, I actually don't know how to say her last name, stu from Student Pergs, um, Expatesta from Re-Earth Initiative, and Abigail Random Marine, Narin, Random Narin, all difficult names, from Bahamas Plastic Movement, and will be moderated by PPC Youth Ambassador Hannah Testa for Hannah for Change. So that'll be the next one. Please tune in, and any youth in your life, any um, leadership uh, kids, get them tuned in. Um, also, next slide, we, we invite you to get involved with us. You can join the coalition and, and also you can, we invite you to connect with us and that's, um, we can connect on social media to learn more. We'll be sending out a link to the survey and we would love to get your feedback at the end as well. And we'll do a follow-up um, email as well with, with all the links. Thank you again, everyone for tuning in today and, um, and we'll see you next time. Cheers.